This is the beginning of a new Maimir, Pachas Mishpatim, which is this week. And one of the most intriguing psukim in the whole Chumash, really. It's, it's a pasuk that describes what happened by the Aseris Adibris. As we know that the Aseris Adibris are described in Pashas Yisrei, which was last week's Pasha. And then some of it is repeated or added in Pashas Mishpatim. And of course, there's discussion in the Rebbe Sichis and Chesidis why the Parsha of Matan Teda is written in two Parshas. And basically, the explanation is that in Pashas Yisrei, it describes the Sinas Ateda, Hashem giving us the Teda, and in Pashas Mishpatim, it describes Kabbalah Sateda, us receiving the Teda. And there are all kinds of details written in Pashas Mishpatim, including the conversion of the Jewish people, the Gerus, and other things. And one of the descriptions in our Pasha is a description of people seeing God, seeing Hashem. And it's two psukim, it's the Dibra Vaskha of this Maimon. The Pasha says, Vayiru Salake Yisro. They saw Alake Yisro, the God of Yisro. Fetachas Raglov, and underneath his feet was Kemaisa Livna Sasapir. Like the action, like the handiwork, like the likeness of Livna Sasapir. Livna Sasapir could mean either white sapphire or bricks of sapphire. As the clear sky is toyhad, is transparent. And then the next passage it says, To the Jewish atzilim, that means the Jewish princes. Hashem did not extend his hand, with, and in Rashi it says, in punishment. They saw Elekim, they ate and they drank. Two psukim. Written in the Chumash, it described Yidin seeing Hashem. Now, of course, the concept of seeing Hashem is Tzri uh, Chalimud. It's, of course, not a very, very simple thing. Firstly, you refer back to Kiyas uh, Yamsuf, which took place some five weeks, six weeks before, where it says in the Pasuk, Zer Keli V'anveyu. And it says in Medrash, as in Chazal, they pointed with their finger and they said, uh, they identified the Jew, they, they identified Hashem. The heavens opened up, they identified Hashem. And of course, it says in Chazal that the children, the children recognized the Kaddish Baruch Hu first, because Hashem had provided for them when they were swallowed up by the earth, when the mothers would deliver the boys in the field, when the Mitzrayim had made the Gezerah to kill all the, the sons, all the boys. So there's other instances we have a concept of seeing God and of course the most familiar reference to the concept of seeing Hashem is what the Gemara says uh, about Ali Laregel when the people went to the Beis HaMikdash so the Gemara says right in the beginning of Masech Tachakiko Keshem Sheba Leroiz Kachba Liris Keshem Sheba Liris Kachba Leroiz that when the Jewish people came to the Beis HaMikdash the Pasuk says Sholish Pahom Bashana Yero it's a mitzvah Sasei De Raisa that a Jew should come to the Beis HaMikdash, Beis HaMikdash three times, a Jewish man, should come to the Beis HaMikdash three times and be seen, Yehira Eh should be seen. So the Gemara says, just like he came to be seen, he also saw. So in the Beis HaMikdash, everybody saw Lakus. And then of course you have other references to the concept of seeing God or godliness. Now obviously, whenever you have an allusion to seeing God, it needs to be understood. It can't be literal, can't be pashtus, because Hashem doesn't look like anything. Hashem has no countenance, Hashem has no appearance. Hashem is, in the words of the Rambam, Motzei Loi B'Metzias. Metzias built in Metzias name, so his existence is not an existential. And therefore the notion of seeing him is always something that deserves to be interpreted. It needs to be explained in a metaphysical way, in a way that's complex and not literal. And Der Haga, parenthetically, there's a fascinating Rambam in Raivid, which is very famous, where the Rambam writes that if somebody says about HaKadosh Baruch Hu, about the Eivish, that he has Gufu Gviya, that he has a body and a form, he's a Min, which is one of the many different allusions to an, to an atheist, to a, to a heretic. And the Raivid gets upset that he says, Kamav G'dele B'teve Mimen Holchu B'zu Ashita. And there were people greater than the Rambam himself who went in this sheet of imagining the Abishta having a body and a body like parts based on the simple reading of the Psukim and the simple reading of the Amore Chazal. 
So let me explain that uh, idea for a moment uh, in preparation for the moment we're going to learn. Jewish people exist on faith. The foundation of our identity is Amun, is faith. But the nature of faith, certainly the nature of faith as it used to be, is that it was never questioned. It's like a foundation, it's like a bedrock, it's just there. And the preoccupation, the busyness of Ayid, what kept the Jew busy was learning Teda, understanding the Teda, interpreting the Teda, and knowing how to do the mitzvahs and practicing the mitzvahs. But Hashem himself was never a study. The idea of trying to understand Hashem was not part of the discussion. It was an infinite moon of shut. The whole idea of starting to understand what Hashem is and the struggle of understanding what Hashem is and whether it's right to understand Him or not right to understand Him comes from outer influences. When it became popular in the Goyesha world to be involved in philosophy, which was trying to explain esoteric things, metaphysical things, malamayla, malamata, malafonim, malachet, and the Jewish people were swept away with the fever of the time, uh, which was philosophy. So the Chacham had no choice but to create Jewish philosophy. And of course, in later times, when there was the Enlightenment and the, the Industrial Revolution and so on and so forth, so Hasidus came on the scene to counteract uh, these uh, changes. And um, this put the Jewish people in the place where they had to ask these kinds of questions, or that they chose to ask these kinds of questions, I needed to get answers. But for much of our history, Hashem was a simple thing, a we don't have the question. And therefore, it's possible for a person to be a goan, a great Talmud Chacham, a great scholar, and uh, imagine Hashem having a body. Why? It's silly to say Hashem has a body. But if you never think about it, if you don't study it, if it's not part of your intellectual uh, parameter, or discipline, when, you, when, you, when you're not familiar with something, you have a simplistic sense of it. So the Raivet says to the Rambam, and this is how it's understood by, by the people who study these things, the Raivet agreed with the Rambam. There's no question that Raivet held that you're not allowed to say Hashem has a body. And saying that Hashem has a body is not even kfira. The Raivet was simply saying to the Rambam, when you, you know, as, the, as the, way the, way the, way the way the story is told, that there were thousands of Neshomas in Ganeid, and when the Rambam wrote those words that a person who believes that Hashem is a Gufan Agvi is a Yemin, they opened the doors of Gan Eden and they sent thousands of Nishamas from Gan Eden to Gehenim because they understood Hashem has a Gufan Agvi, Lefisharol, Bepshuti Hamakrois, Vyesib, Mamari Chazal. They never thought about it, so they accepted the, the biblical story and the rabbinic allusions as literal. So the Ravid countered the Rambam and said, Excuse me, how dare you say that? People greater than the Rambam believed this, so they opened the doors of Gehenna and sent them back into Gan Eden. But it wasn't that the Ravid Chasashom disagreed with the Rambam. Of course, it's impossible to say Hashem has a body or any kind of a form. He was simply saying that if a person construes that Hashem has a form based on a munapshuta, that doesn't mean that's not an applicatus. A person is an applicatus if he argues it intellectually and theologically and philosophically, that's kfidah. But if a person just simply accepts what says in the Teda, because he doesn't question it and he doesn't uh, analyze it critically, that's amuna, that's simple faith. So there was that whole school of thought, right? But at the same time, as we stand today, Jewish theology has had to, whether we like it or not, explore these questions. And as a consequence, we have a much more profound idea of what it means, Vayiru Vasalakei Yisro which is the next possible. There's, there's much subtlety, there's much nuance, there's much scholarship, there's much profundity in what this means. They saw the case, or they saw the Ebishter, basically, they saw God. What does it all mean? And like I started to say, clearly, one thing it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean they saw a body. It's an Indian Ruchni, it's a metaphysical thing, it's a spiritual thing. It's, if you will, like a form of Ruach HaKodesh or even a form of Navua. It's a vision. And in this vision, you're not seeing Hashem. Actually, you're seeing something which is representative of HaKadosh Baruch. So there's no question. There's no question at all. When you read these two psukim, and these two psukim say that uh, by Har Sinai, the Jewish people looked up and they saw Lukus, 
And like Rashi says in a different pasuk, that Behar Sinai he was a zaken malirachmim, and, and, and the Yamsuf he was a a gibber, a Muhammad, that Hashem's countenance changed based on what he was doing. At the sea he was a warrior, and Har Sinai he was a sage with a lot of compassion, and so on. All of these things have to be understood in metaphysical terms, in ruchni is terms. So the maime which we have is addressing these questions, but the maime that we have is addressing these questions on the Hasidic level, uh, which is a specific or a very deep way of understanding all of these anthropomorphic forms where you talk about seeing al Kaddish Baruch Hu and his hands and his feet and so on and so forth, as our maime is going to reference. So the first thing that we want to make clear as we, so to speak, approach this, is that there's no question, the meaning of the words by Yiru is only Kei Yisrael is a metaphysical thing. It doesn't mean it physically. So Hashem, it's a Inyan Ruchni. Having said that, we move on to the basic divide when it comes to this kind of a question. The, the, the Torah is filled. Filled, filled. With hundreds of anthropomorphic allusions to HaKadosh Baruch That means... The Torah is filled with many situations where the Torah is describing Hashem as though Hashem were human. In the Torah you have Hashem speaking. In the Torah you have Hashem getting angry. In the Torah you have Hashem getting sad. In the Torah you even have Hashem changing his mind. And you certainly have the idea of Hashem's eyes and Hashem's ears and Hashem's mouth and Hashem's nose and so on. And of course the question becomes, what does this mean? What does it mean that Hashem changes his mind? What does it mean that Hashem gets angry? What does it mean that Hashem has arms and legs and eyes and ears and so forth and so on? It's the classic question of anthropomorphism. How do we understand all of the anthropomorphic allusions to HaKadosh Baruch? So, in Jewish theology, in Jewish Hashkofa, Machshev Asayadus, of course there are many approaches. But the many approaches come down to two approaches. There's two basic approaches. And if you're a regular to these shiurim, which are now Baruch Hashem, seven years old or more, you've, you've heard us discuss this before, because this is a topic that comes up periodically. It's an important topic. It's a good topic. And it also happens to be a topic that particularly interests me. And that is the division between the Chaytri Yisrael and the Chachmi Ha'emis, the Jewish philosophers and the Jewish mystics. The... The Jewish philosophers include such personalities as the Rambam, and Apsad Yegoen, and Rabbi Yisaf Albo, and Rabbi Yudha Halevi, and so on. And of course the mystical camp is the Zayar, and then later on it's uh, the, the Arizal, and the Ramak, and the Sakedish, and then of course all of this trickles down into Pnim Yisateir and Chesidus, Kabbalah, as we have it. These schools of thought are basically distinct. They're fundamentally different. What's the difference between the school of thought of philosophy and the school of thought of mysticism? The difference is very, very simple. Philosophy is not part of Torah. Philosophy is a secular chokhmah. If you want to call it a science, go ahead. I don't think it's a science, but if you want to call it a science, go ahead and call it a science. Philosophy is a system of logic. It's a series of laws of logic that govern uh, observing and interpreting phenomena, which comes from Goyishkeit, comes from the Greeks, comes from earlier than the Greeks. It goes all the way back to Adam and to Enesh and to Neach and so on. And one of the basic teachings of philosophy is that everything is logical. God is logic. Hashem is the essence of logic. So something which is not logical is automatically false. The other theology is Kabbalah. And Kabbalah is Kishmai Kain, who, as the name itself suggests, and it insinuates Kabbalah he ne Kabbalah. It's something you have to accept. It's something which we know. Bederach it's, it's Kabbalah is true because it was passed down to us from Jewish people who had the Ruach Hakedish. What the Rebbe calls it in the Gerus Hakedish Yates, And they saw on some level of Ruach Hakedish these levels, and on that basis we know say the secrets of the Torah, Chochmas Kabbalah. So when it comes to the question of anthropomorphism, when it comes to the question of the Torah using many references and allusions to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which sound human, these two schools of thought diverge very, very seriously. The philosophical school of thought has no room for it. 
The philosophical school of thought says Hashem is partial betachas abshita. Hashem is absolutely plain. Hashem has no form and Hashem has no defin- detail. Hashem has no definition and so forth. What about the hundreds of references in Tanakh and in Chazal that describe a Kaddish Baruch Hu as being anthropomorphic or anthro-like, anthropic in his form and in his description and so forth and so on. So in Chochmah Sachkira, in the pre-mysticism, the pre-Kabbalah, Jewish theology, there's one answer to all of these questions. And that is, Dibra Torah Keloshen B'nei the Torah speaks in the language of man. When you describe Hashem seeing, it doesn't mean Hashem has eyes. It doesn't mean Hashem sees. It means that something reaches us, which is experienced by us as if Hashem is looking. So we describe Him as seeing. When something reaches a person that sounds like an act of kindness, we say Hashem is being kind. Although by Hashem there's no midas. When something reaches us, which sounds like an act of tzedakah, we say it comes from Hashem's right hand, although Hashem does not have a hand. So why is he described anthropomorphically? And the answer is because we want to make it closer for us to understand and therefore you use all of these anthropomorphic allusions to make it easy for us to fathom. And again, it's all under the one simple phrase which is found in the Gemara, but Rebbe speaks the language of man. Now we're going to come back to this soon. What about Kabbalah and Chassidus? What about mysticism? They have a very, very different approach. And the approach that you have in Kabbalah and Chassidus is that the Teda is not telling us lies. If the Teda says Yad Hashem and Regal Hashem and Ein Hashem and uh, Amir Hashem and Achshav Hashem and Charein Af Hashem and Nechumin from Hashem and so on and so forth has to be true. But how can you describe the Ebi as in a human form, an anthropomorphic form, we all know that Hashem is Pasha Betachas Abshitos. So the answer in Chochmah Sakabola is that all these ideas are true in Atzilus. Atzilus is called Adam Elyon. Atzilus is the way godliness comes down into a seer of Adam. And over the years, we've had many, 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 many opportunities to explain to some extent what Atzilus means. And in this mime, it's going to be discussed again. Perhaps we'll have opportunity again to delve into it at length. But in short, Atzilus is Adam. Adam means a complex form of divided aspects that are integrated in a healthy way. Like I like to say always, Adam is a minimum of right, left, center, top, middle, bottom, which is nine. We have separate aspects to the right, to the left, to the center, to the top, to the middle, and the bottom, but they're all be his scholars, they're integrated as one, which is what makes it Kedusha. And all of the allusions, all of the references that are anthropomorphic about HaKadosh Baruch Hu is true in the spheres and medias of Atzilus. Higher than Atzilus, we agree with Kabbalah, with Chikina. That you can't say he has hands, you can't say that he has feet, you can't say that he has mood, you can't say that he has regrets. And all of the ideas are even Dibra Tere Kalashim and Yadam. When it comes down into Mamal Kalam, when it comes down into Atzilus, we say that these things have truth. In this past, you have Hashem's regal, and Hashem's Yad, Hashem's foot, and Hashem's hand, which is going to become the basis for this quite lengthy maimah. What is the meaning of Yad Hashem? And what is the meaning of Regal Hashem? So in, Ch- in Chakira, in Jewish philosophy, we would say it's, it's all anthropomorphic, it's all allegory. None of this is real, none of this is literal. Taylor speaks in the language of man. But in Chassidus and Kabbalah, we say that, to use the Yiddish expression, the way godliness arranges itself in the model and the form of Adam, which is called Atzilus. And like I said earlier, we've had lengthy discussions on this, so this is why now we're being a little bit makatsir. So when you say Yad Hashem and Ein Hashem, these things have some literal truth as it exists within the world of Atzilus. In other words, now let's repeat this entire conversation one more time using a different form. The question that we have on the table, the conversation we're having, is about this notion of anthropomorphism. The question of the Torah describing Hashem as a human being. So philosophy, Jewish philosophy, Rambam, Rasag, Yudah Halevi, and so on, would answer all of these questions by saying it's Ohakel Moshe Lomlit, it's all allegory, it's all not literal, it's all a riddle, and it's based on the principle of Dibra Tede Kaloshen B'nayad, and the Tede speaks in the language of man, Lakarav al to make it easy for us to understand, and so on. And in Chacham HaSakabola, there's some literal truth, all of these in Yonim, as it exists in the Midas Savatzilas, the Svira Savatzilas, in what we call Adam Ha'elyan. So there's another way to say the same thing that I just said. And the Rambam discusses this in the Meir Nebuchadnezzar and Chelek at length, in his Darach, in his Shita. 
And that is that whenever you talk about a phenomena, which is an act, which is a proactivity, which is a deed, you speak about three things, payal, pula, and nifal. Payal means the one doing it, that means the principle. Pu'ula means the tool with which it's performed. The word pu'ula doesn't mean action. It means the tool with which the action is performed. And nifal means the effect of that action. In other words, if you say that Hashem raised his hand and hit the yamsuf, let's just say for the sake of it, the payal is Hashem. The pu'ula would be the hand. And the nifal would be that the yamsuf was hit. So, when it comes to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, everybody agrees, everybody agrees that there's no payal. Chas v'shalom chalila v'chas, God forbid to say that in the Abish to himself, which is the cause of the effect, there is any kind of hand or any kind of foot or any kind of mood or any kind of anything. And there's no disagreement whatsoever with Yechkir and Kabbalah as far as that question is concerned. When it comes to the payal, the one doing the, which is Hashem, namely Hashem. In Hashem there's no Midas, in Hashem there's no Evarim. It's all not literal, it's all allegory. The question becomes, what about the pool and the Nifa? And this is where the difference is. In Chachma Sachkira, in Jewish philosophy, in other words, non-Kabbalah theology, you can attribute to HaKadosh Baruch only the Nifa and not the Pu'ula. That means something happens in this world, which if a person would have done it, he would have done it with his hand. And based on the event which happened in the world, we say, for Yad Yisrael, it's a Yad Agadeh, we see Hashem's hand. In other words, we attribute to Elokus just the Nifal. Not the Pail, not even the Pail, just the effect. When something happens in this world which, look hands, which looks hand-like, we call it his hand. When something happens in this world which we call Seeing like, we call it his eyes. When something happens in this world, which is called paying attention and being sensitive, we use the word das. But all we have is the nifl. That's how it's understood in Chachma Sachkira, Jewish philosophy. And in Chesidus, we say that the pool also exists. Not only is there the effect of the yad, and the effect of the regal, there's a concept of a yad, and the concept of a regal, which are the midas of Atzilus, the spheres of Atzilus. And that's really how you understand the difference between Chachkira and Kabbalah from a theological perspective. Both of them address the question of how could you say that Hashem has anthropomorphic form, framework, whether it's hands or it's feet or it's mood or it's regret or it's sadness or it's happiness or it's anger. And both agree that when it comes to Hashem Himself, none of this is literal. And both agree that all of this is metaphysical, it's not literal, it's not physical, it's not actual. But they argue whether you can attribute to the Abish to just the effect of his pu'ula or the pu'ula itself. So in Chakira, when it says in the Teira, the Yidin saw Hashem's hand, it means they saw something happen in the world, which if it were done by people, they would have used their hands. And we therefore call it Hashem's hand, even though Hashem has no hand. But in Chochmah Sakabal, it's more complex. In Chochmah Sakabal, we say, no, he has a hand. Chesed Dreyeyemina. Chesed is Abish's right hand. In other words, we have a Kusis, Mislabish. In the Sphere of Savatzilas, you can say a right hand and a left hand. So again, here is two psukim in the Teda, which describe the Jewish people seeing HaKadosh Baruch. So to repeat the very first thing I said, in an age when people never questioned HaKadosh Baruch, before philosophy came along to be, create nevuchim, to entangle and confuse Jewish people, and Jewish people with women of Shuta, there may have been people, some of whom were quite intelligent, that Holchom was the they wish as a guf and a because they never thought about it. But the moment it became necessary, to answer the secular philosophies with the Jewish philosophy, and then of course later on with the Gilim, which would eventually descend and reach us through the incredible maton of Primis Ateir of Chochmas, Chassidus Chabad, Chassidus Chabad. Here we don't simply say, we don't say it's all allegory. We say that there are Midas and Sfiris, Lamaila, that account for, that explain Yad Hashem, and Regal Hashem, and Ein Hashem, and, and so on and so forth. Nichume Hashem, and so on. So, with this background, let's go to this story. The Jewish people saw Lukus. And underneath his feet, there was Kemais, the Livnes, and Sapiruch, Etzer, Shmaim, Lotair. And the next Pasuk says, Velasile, Bnei Yisrael, Le Yishalach, Yodei. So I want to start with this. If you look to Mepharshim on these Pasuk, 
Look at the commentaries in these pilgrims. They saw the K. You saw Vatachas Raglov. Let's go back to the Pasuk one more time. What does it say? They saw the God of Israel. And beneath his feet was Kemaisa Livna Sasape. It was like the action, the handiwork of Livna Sasape, which means bricks of sapphire or white sapphire. And at the sky, which is without, without any end, is transparent. The, the sky has no color, the sky has no more, much as you see straight through it. So how does Rashi explain that this is a marshal for the idea of the Jewish people who were in Mitzrayim and they slaved. And what was the nature of their slavery? It was Bechem and Abulvenim. They had to make Levenim, they had to make bricks, mud bricks. And of course to make mud bricks they needed to have clay, needed to have water, needed to have molds, and they also needed to have straw. And of course, we all know the story, what happened, Meishu Rabbeinu came and Parah deprived them of the straw, and what happened consequently, subsequent to that. And they had made mud bricks, which of course leads us to the obvious conclusion that the idea that the Jewish people made the pyramids and other stone structures in Egypt is foolish. Because the pyramids lasted for all these thousands of years because they were made of rock, of stone. The Jewish people did not work with rock or stone, they worked with mud bricks, which would disintegrate in the rain. They have a much more shorter life than the pyramids made of stone. So the Yidn were busy with Levena, with, with cement, with bricks. And as this Maimah is going to develop, you'll see that there's two in Yonim. There's Avonim and there's Levena. There's stones and there's bricks. Stones are Bidei Shamaim. Stones the Abish to create. And Levena and bricks is Bidei Adam. And it's one of the key purposes of this Maimah is to explain the difference between the stone which the Abish made, which is called Avonim, and the stone which man made, which is called Levena. So the Jewish people came to Har Sinai. They got the tether from the Yabish. They looked up. Yechaz was a Lekimah. They had a vision, they had a prophecy that allowed them to see something with to do with a Lekus. What did they see? Livna Sasapi. That the Yabish that had under his Kisya covered mud bricks. Mud bricks. That the mud bricks were made from Livna Sasapi, from fine, fine sapphire. Because it's after all a mile and not Lamata. But there was a clear message in it. And the message is, you suffered in Messiah making bricks, I suffered in Messiah with you, Vaharaya, I'm putting a brick up in your house. In, 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 in the vision of Harsina. So the Ashi says a, a simple pshat, he didn't saw a vision. And of course, without any question, this is a metaphysical idea, it's not a literal and physical idea, it was a prof- prophecy of some sort. And the prophecy was saying, when you suffered in Egypt, I suffered with you, Vaharaya, I'm still carrying around the bricks. That's why Rashi Titus came out to live in it's a simple taich, and it's a logical taich. It's a pshat taich. It doesn't go into metaphysics, it doesn't go into anything esoteric, but it does address the question. And of course, as it says in the sequence of the psukim, that here were the Jewish people standing at Har Sinai, and they saw the course, they saw godliness. They saw godliness just like they saw godliness. They saw godliness like people would see godliness in the Beis Hamikdash. But Libam Gas, they were so comfortable with seeing godliness that they forgot what they were standing in front of and they acted very comfortable. As represented by the words, they ate and they drank, they were much entertaining themselves, enjoying themselves in the presence of Elokus. So Rashi says they deserve to be punished, they should really have been put to death. But the Abisha did not want to mix Simcha with Avela, so he postponed it for a different time. But this is Rashi's translation of the words, they looked up, they saw Lakus, which is a metaphysical vision, as he's giving them the Torah, and what did they see? They saw that he suffered with them in Golos, and he came with them from the Golos, and this is his Chus, um, this is his right, so to speak, to be involved with the Jewish people and give us the Torah. The Abisha was us in Golos, that's what Rashi says. Simple Pshat. Is this pshat mystical? No. Is this pshat philosophical? Probably not either. If anything, it's probably closer to mysticism than it's philosophy. But one thing is certain, that Rashi is also explaining the psukim not as being physical and literal. They saw Hashem. They saw a likeness which represented Hashem's involvement in their lives. This is what uh, Rashi says. Then of course you have the Ramban. And the Ramban says that Maisa lived in the Sasapi, is like the idea of seeing the Kisya covered. We all know what says in Yechezkel that Niftuch Hashemayim Veremar Salakim, that the Navi Ezekiel, who lived at the time of the Chorban Fish Base, and Mikdash saw Lukus. 
and you have it in chapter 1 of Yechezkel, and again you have it in chapter 10 or 11, I think it's 27 psukim that describe the divine chariot. And the difference between the two accounts in, chap- in Pasuk Al, Pasuk Hezvav, is relatively minor. And it describes the hierarchy, the whole throne room of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that underneath there's a Fanim, on top of the Fanim there's Chayes, and on top of the Chayes there's a Rakia, on top of the Rakia there's a Kisei, on top of the Kisei there's a Odom HaYeshev Al HaKisei. So when it says, Vayiros Alakei Yisrael Vatachas Raglov, it means they saw the Odom Al HaKisei, and Tachas Raglov means the Kisei HaKovid, which is holding up the Odom Al HaKisei, and all the other details which I so can bring are representing the the hierarchy of the Lakus levels, which, so to speak, um, support a Lakus. So the Ramban translates these two psukim of the Jewish people, saw so seeing the Merkava, the divine chariot, and the Shechini, which rests upon it. This is interesting and uh, involved. And of course, it's beyond the scope of our conversation to delve into this at length. But let us suffice to say that if we understand the Ramban correctly. The Ramban is saying that the Merkava that the Jewish people saw, uh, I'm sorry, that the, the, the likeness that the Jewish people saw of the Dinah Merkava, the Merkava is called Nivdal. The Merkava is not the Lakus. The Merkava is not Atzilis. The Merkava is Briya. The Merkava is Malach. With all the limitations of Malach. Then you have the Rambam. And the Rambam is very, very interesting. The Rambam is most interesting. The Rambam says like this, that something which is colorless becomes a mirror. Something that has a color, it absorbs something of what you're, what's looking into it, and therefore it doesn't give anything back. But something which has no color absorbs everything and it gives it back. And the reason something which has no color is able to give things back is because when you're completely clear, when you're completely pure, there's room for another in you. I heard once a verse from one of the Pelish Shagut Ayid in the Chassidish Rebbes, somebody asked him once how he could read other people's minds. He said, very simple, if one's own thoughts are pure and perfect, there's room for somebody else's. So the Rebbe says, I made in the Kavar, the Yiddish of the Kays, the other door of the God of Israel, Tachas, Ragla, but underneath his Raglaim. And the Rambam interprets Raglaim means his cause. This Hashem and what He does. And the Raglayim means the, th- the things the Ebesh did affect. Kemaisa liveness of sapphire is a likeness of white sapphire. And white sapphire has no color, it's transparent. And therefore, white sapphire is like the transparent heavens that has no color and doesn't show itself. And therefore, when you look at it, what do you see? You see yourself. And that's how the Rambam teaches this passage. We've talked about this many times over the years. What did they see? They saw themselves reflected off Alakos. Because since Alakos is Livna Sazapi, white, colorless sapphire, and therefore this Ketzam Mashamayim Lote says it has no color, no predisposition. You see yourself. So, what does it mean that the Jewish people saw Alakos at Har Sinai? They saw Alakos in their own image. Each person's vision of Alakos reflected where they were. So there's the story with the previous Rebbe that he visited Eretz Yisrael and he sat with a group of Elter Chesidim and there's a letter, a very moving letter from the previous Rebbe to his daughter, Rabbonus Hasid Karnas Shendel, where he describes that all these people are sitting and looking at him and everyone is looking to see their Rebbe in him. This one wants to see his father, this one wants to see his grandfather, this one wants to see his great-grandfather, this one wants to see this uncle or this uncle and so on. So by this meeting, there was a Yid who described who the Rebbe Rashab was. And the previous Rebbe responded and says, You're not describing my father, you're describing my father in your image. Because when you look at a tzaddik, you see the tzaddik as he's a reflection of you, because the tzaddik is perfectly transparent. So you see the tzitkis of the tzaddik as it reflects upon you. Somebody else sees something much more or much different and so on. And that's how the Rambam teaches, V'etachas raglov kamaisa livnes asapit. The Ramam teaches that this whole Pesach is one point. Our Maimah is going to divide them into two points. But the Ramam makes them into one point. What do you see? When you look at godliness, you see yourself. Why when you look at godliness do you see yourself? Because godliness is plain, is infinite, is, trans, is transparent, is colorless. And therefore everybody sees what they, in their Lakus, an imprint of themselves. And that's what the Yidin saw at Har Sina. They saw Lakus, and they saw how Lakus reflects whatever they are. 
And then, of course, we get to the discussion of our Maimir, and the discussion of our Maimir is to explain these Psukim al Pichsidis. And how do we understand these Psukim al Pichabal al Pichsidis? This goes on the Sphiris of Atsilis. And when you're speaking about the Sphiris of Atsilis, it's not the Pshat that you see the effect, the influence of the Sphiris of Atsilis. Um, and that constitutes an action, like the Chokrim hold. But rather, there's actually the Midas and Sphiris of Atsilis. The Ebishta has these Midas. And there's something called the Lake Yisrael. And the Lake Yisrael that goes in the Sphiris of Atsilis. And this Lake Yisrael has a Rego. This Lake Yisrael has a Yad. And the ideas that our Maimra are going to be discussing using the terms Yad Hashem and Regal Hashem are going to become very significant. Apikabol and Apikhsidis, because we're going to understand the idea of a Yad, the idea of a Regal, not just in a simplistic way, but in a far more complicated way. So we're more or less ready to start the Maimir at this point. What we've done in the last half hour or so is mention again this whole notion that the Teda has cases where it's describing Hashem in a way that looks anthropomorphic. And of course, none of this is literal. All has to be explained figuratively. And in Chochmas HaKabalu, we say, Dibra Tere Kalashem the other, and all there is is the Nifal. And in Chochmas, I'm sorry, in Chochmas HaKidu, we say, Dibra Tere Kalashem the other, and all there is is the Nifal. And in Chochmas HaKabalu, we say that Natsilas, this is true, and there's also the Pu'ula. And that's the Pshat, the Regal Hashem and the Yad Hashem, which Maimir is going to be discussing. So now let's begin to learn the actual Maimir. The Pasuk says, Vayidu was Eleke Yisrael. The Jewish people saw Eleke Yisrael, what is the Elekus of Yisrael, the godliness of Yisrael. Vesach Hasraglov, and underneath his feet is Kemaisa Livnas Hasapir Vegemer. There was the likeness of Livnas Hasapir, which either, which either means sapphire bricks or white sapphire, as Rambam would explain it. Uch Etzamashamayim Loteir, and like the sky is colorless and transparent. And of course, the next Pasuk says, Velatsi Libne Yisrael Le Shalach Yode, the young princes who were acting very comfortable in the presence of revelation of godliness, he did not punish them. They ate and they drank. So our Maimir is attempting to explain these psuk. Ultimately, we're going to find out that our Maimir is actually going to focus on two points, basically. The two points are going to be the point, the word the regal in the Pasuk. Here, Tachas Raglov, and the word Yad, which is in the next Pasuk, In other words, although in these Psukim, there's so much that can be understood in terms of explaining the Esesfiris of Atsilos, Adam Elyin, and how you have in Atsilos, the union of Yad and Regal, on an Elkus level, and so on, and Livnas Hasapir, and Tashmaim Loteir, and so forth, but the the point that the Rebbe is ultimately going to get to is the concept of Regal and Yad. He's going to discuss many other things as well, but the, the, uh, the trajectory, the direction of the Rebbe's arrow in this Maimed is to explain Yad and Regal. Says the Rebbe, Hine inyen tachas raglov. What does it mean? Beneath HaKadosh Baruch Hu's feet. Tachas raglov, beneath HaKadosh Baruch Hu's feet. So let's stop right here. Let's stop right here. We know that the Rambam wrote Peter Shamilis, right? The whole first section of the Meir Nebuchim is Rambam translating words. Or a very significant portion of the first section, most of the first section. Why does the Rambam translate words? Because the Rambam wants to give us a sense of metaphysics. When you say that the Abish has a foot, what does it mean? Of course it doesn't have a foot. So the Rambam would say, what does a foot mean? The end of a person. The foot is the lowest level of the person. And Tachas Raglov, it is what is beneath the lowest level of the person. So the Rambam would take every single anthropomorphic allusion of the Torah and explain it this way. When the Psukim say Kisei, when the Psukim say Yeshiva, when the, whatever the Pasuk says that describes what amounts to an anthropomorphic form, the Rambam gives you a metaphysical way of looking at it. So he would say that the Regal would mean the lowest level of Elokus, and Tachas Raglov means the symptom of that. Because the Abish exists, there is a certain effect from Hashem which reaches us, which is called Tachas Raglov. Below the lowest level of Elokus, you have Kach Vakach. That's how the Rambam would translate the words, Tachas Raglov. 
Now, of course, Kabbalah and Hasidus would translate it similarly, but a little bit different. Why? Because in philosophy, when we would say Tachas Ragla, we would say all you have is the Nifal Hashem has no foot, and there's no such thing as underneath the foot. But when you see something that reaches you, that seems to be underneath where godliness ends, we call it Tachas Ragla. As opposed to in Chochmas Achsidis, Chochmas Kabbalah, that we understand that the Pu'ula also exists in the Sphere of Atzilas, you can say all of these things. So Regal would be Malchus of Atzilas. And Tachas Ragla would be what's called in Chsidis Ragleha Yerdes, how the feet of Atzilas come into the next world. And that's exactly how the Rebbe is going to explain Tachas Raglov in this moment. And the Regal goes to the lowest level of Atzilus. And Tachas Raglov underneath the lowest level of Atzilus is Maisa Libna Sasap. And as you're going to see, as this moment develops and unfolds. So the Rebbe says, I'm reading again on line 4. Hine. Inyan Tachas Raglov who? When you say that the Ebishta has feet. And our Maimed is not going to give us comparative theologies, right? I spent the last 35 or 40 minutes giving you different approaches. Our Maimed is going to speak only Kabbalah, only Chesidus, and explain certain aspects of this Pasuk, which means you, you can probably study this Pasuk more and more and more. So Tachas Raglov, underneath the feet of Alakus, is Masha Kosov, al Musa Kisei, that on the likeness of the Kisei of the Abish, the seat is the most kemare Adam vegamer. There is the likeness of the countenance of Adam. Of Adam, of course, means Adam and it goes on Atzilus. Now, in this passage, there's a lot of words, right? There's the word Kisei and there's the word Adam. Kisei means the Abish, the seat, which in Kabbalah is Elam Abriya. Adam means the anthropomorphic form, which in Lashna Kabbalah is Elam Atzilus. But the word Kisei comes along with the word Dumus. And the word Adam comes along with the word Dmus and the word Mare. And each one of these little details are explained in Hasidus. This Kisei and this Dmus Kisei. Kisei would be a higher level and Dmus Kisei would be a lower level. Adam would be a higher level. Mare Adam would be a lower level. And Dmus Kamare Adam would be an even lower level. If I recall correctly, Mare Adam would be Zav Atzilus and Dmus Kamare Adam would be Malchus of Atzilus. So the Pasuk says, so the Rebbe says, Tachas Raglav, underneath the Raglayim, of course, there's the Muskise. The Raglayim are part of Adam. The feet of Elokus, which goes on the spheres of Atzilus, is part of Adam. And Tachas Raglav, underneath Raglav, is the Kise. Just like a person sits on a chair, so the person is on top and the chair holds him up, the chair is underneath him. So in metaphysical terms, there's something called the Muskise. And on the top of the Demus Kisei, there's Demus Kamara Yadam. But our mind describes it backwards. There's Raglayim. The Raglayim is the very, very end of Demus Kamara Yadam. And under the Raglayim of Demus Kamara Yadam, you could see what's lower than Demus Kamara Yadam. What is lower than Demus Kamara Yadam? Demus Kisei. And the Demus Kisei, which is lower than Demus Kamara Yadam, is Kemaisa Livnes Asapiruch Etzam Hashemayim Lateya. So the words are describing the chair on which the Abish sits. And in the Lashna Kabbalah that goes in general El Mabriya. El Mabriya is called El Makise, Elam of Kursaya, the seat, the throne on which the Abish sits. And Adam goes on Atsilas. Adam Elian goes on Atsilas. And Adam, which goes on Atsilas, has different midas, different spheres, different madregas. Amongst the different Midas and Sfiris and Madregas, you have an Atsilus, you have the equivalent of Regal and Yad. That's what the Rebbe says. Uba Bechinas Kamari Yodam. Now we're talking about Odom. In particular, we're talking about Mara Odom. And even more particularly, when you're talking about Dmus Kamari Yodam, Shayach Yad Veregal. You can say a hand and a foot. So right away, the Rebbe tells you what he is identifying. Right, all the fancy words, which all the Mephoshim were trying to figure out, the Rebbe says, eh, that's, <laughs> that's Labar Migof, that's outside of Elokos. That's the Kisei, that's the chair. But on top of the chair is, is sitting what we call Adam, Elokos and the Tzir of Adam, 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 Adam he says in, in, in the Demus of Adam, Adam Ha'elian. And since Elokos is called Adam, you could say Yad Veregel. In other words, Hashem by himself is ain't safe. But Hashem comes down 
And again, we've talked about this idea many times over the years, explaining what Adam means and why it's Elokus and how it's connected to Atzilus and so on. It says the Rebbe, you could say Yad and Regal. As it's going to say in the next Pasuk, And this is also the illusion we're going to have in the next Pasuk, where it says, So the word Yad of the next Pasuk. And the word regal of this pasuk are part of Atzilus, part of other Melian. And Uchetz, because Ma'aseh lived in Sasapir Uchetz, and Shmaim Loteri, this is Kis Yaakov. So the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, right away brings him to the world of Kabbalah. He doesn't explain it philosophically, metaphysically. He explains it mystically. And in mysticism, there's Atzilus. Atzilus is Adam. In mysticism, there's a Kisei, there's a Merkava, which is Bria. And in Adam, there's Yad Veregel. And our Maimon is going to be talking primarily about the Yad Veregel. Of course, we're going to talk about Maisel Livnas and Sapir. Of course, we're going to talk about Metzim Mashvayim Loteir. We're actually going to talk about everything. But the aspect of this Pasuk that the Alter Rebbe identifies at the very beginning and says, let's figure this out, is the aspect of Yad Veregel. In other words, he's going to say all, he's going to explain all the psukim, but he says, I'm intrigued. What is the relationship between Regal and Maith Levitz and Sabcha and Shmaim Loteir? And what is the concept of Yad that it says by the Atzila B'nei Yisrael, Le'i Sholach Yodei? And that's how this Maimir is constructed. When Rebbe made this Maimir, he thought about the aspects of Yad Veregal, and everything else is going to be helping us understand what it means Yad Veregal by Yelukus, by Atzilas, as it relates to this particular Maimir. Says the Rebbe, the question becomes, we understand that there is the Muskise, which is Bria. We understand that there's Adam, there's Mara Adam, and there's Musk Mara Adam, which is basically Atsilus. And we understand that in Atsilus it's appropriate to say Yad Veregel, the Svidas of Atsilus, are compared to the anthropomorphic form of Adam. And like I said to you earlier, not only when we Yachas Talakus the Nifal, as the Chekrim apply it, but we also Yachas Talakus the Pale, which means the Pu'ulu, which is the Vidas. And the question comes, How could you say in God with his hands and feet? Hashem has no body, nor do you have a body like division, parts. So how could we say about the Eibishter Yad Veregel? Elokus is godliness, right? What do we know about godliness? That it's a plain, infinite reflection of its source. How do you have hands and feet? This is a classic question. How do you have hands and feet, Lamailu? And again, in classes that we've given in the past, we've spent much time explaining what it means in Atzilas. And in very, very brief, what we've discussed in years past and in classes past and in my modern past is that there are two models for Ein Seif. The first model of Ein Seif is called Mo'id. And the second model of Ein Seif is called Adam. Mo'id and Adam are the same letters. They're exactly the same thing inside out, inverse to one another. Mo'id means infinite, plainness, where there's no distinction, there's no aspects, there's no parts, there's just infinite plainness of Elokos. And Adam means infinite complexity, which adds up to plainness. In other words, Adam means detail. And basically, an Adam consists of a right and a left and a center, which is balance. A top and a middle and a bottom, which is balance. And the integration between all three, across and all three up and down, which is called in Chesidus Hiskalalus. You have many different aspects. Each one is distinct. And they join together as different aspects to create a whole. And according to Chesidus, the complexity and the order of Adam is equal and opposite to the Ma'id. Just like Ma'id is infinite and plain, the Adam is infinite in its complexity and in its order and in its harmony and its peacefulness. And again, now I'm not explaining this to you at length. I'm just giving you the Nekudah because we've talked about it many times. But this is a classic idea, of course, of Kabbalah that Adam is ain't safe in its seed of Svidas and Kedem and Midas and so on. So the Rebbe asks, how could that be? How could you have in a Lakus a tzir? So the Rebbe continues on line 9 and he says, well, in your it says as follows. He makes of the Pasuk says, Ani Avaya Leishanisi. That Havaya, which basically goes on in safe, 
says, Ani, I, who was called Havaya, Leishani, see in me there is no change. Now, we've had the Pasuk, Ani, Havaya, Leishani, see, in classes past, many times. And in Tanya, of course, it appears in chapter 20, in Pedic Chof, the Rebbe brings the Pasuk of Ani, Havaya, Leishani, see. And I always tell you the same thing. When you explain the Pasuk, Ani, Havaya, Leishani, see, you have to first define what Havaya is. Because there's many different Havayas. And after you define what Havaya is, you can then define the Leisha Nisi. So the Rebbe has to define what Havaya is, and then he has to define the Leisha Nisi. Pirush. What's the touch Leisha Nisi? She'ein shum shini atzayi As far as Hashem himself is concerned, there's no change. That bein keidem b'riya se'elam vishtashlo se'elam esayenim. Just like there was prior to creation of the world. And the chain reactions of worlds, the higher ones and the lower worlds. Obeying la Achabriasailam and after they created all the worlds, to Havaya does Lo Shanisi. Whatever Havaya is, there is no difference pre and post creation. Just like before the creation there was nothing but the Abishtir. After the Abishtir created the world, it continues to be true that there's nothing but the Abishtir. What about the world? To Havaya it's Lo Shanisi. Or Kamai Malakat says, and the Siddhir Atu, Kedem Shinevacholo, you are the Abishdir before the Abishdir created the world, you are the Abishdir after the created the world, there's no difference whatsoever. What's the Pshat? How could you say, Havaya Leishanisi, before there was no world, now there is a world? And the Teret says, Pasha, Tvahai Nolifi, the answer is, because Shemekeid, his Havus, Kola Elemis, the root and source from which the Abishdir creates all of the worlds, is Irak Mebechinis Malchusi, is Barach, is from the kingship of Akadish Barachu. Like it says, Malchus Chamalchus Kol Elam. The Eibush is involved in the word only Melech. So the investment, the aspect of Alakus interested and invested in the world is only Melech. Shurak Bechinas Ara Bialma. That the idea that the Eibush is a king over the world is a trace, is a secondary, a tertiary light of what the Eibush did himself is. In other words, not only is Malchus not Hashem, Malchus is not even Hashem's aid. That the name of HaKadosh Baruch Hu is the makif over the creation. And since the investment of Hashem in this world is only Ha'orah, only Malchus. And even this Ha'orah which is Malchus is a makif Shmei Nikra Leim. When you're talking about what's higher than Malchus, Ein Zepeil Shum Shinu Echas V'Sholem, this affects no change whatsoever. God forbid, Bim Husei Vatzmusi and Hashem Himself. So the Pshat Ani Avai Leishanisi is, Havaya doesn't go on Hashem. Havaya goes on Ein Seif, on Oyer. And Havaya says, Leisha Nisi. The investment of Havaya in creation is a Ha'orah, the Ha'orah, is a secondary light. The investment of Havaya in creation is Malchus. So Havaya itself says, Leisha Nisi. The investment that it gives to the Abish, to, this, to the world, pardon me, is so secondary that what Havaya is by itself is unaffected by the world. So there's something called Eid Ein Seif. And Eidin Seif makes a statement, Leishanisi, before there was a world, I was Eidin Seif. Now that there's a world, I'm Eidin Seif. There's no difference in me. Where's there a difference in a tiny light which radiates from me, which invests itself in the world, in the Indian of Melucha, that's where the Shanisi is. That's the Pshat of this Pasuk in this Maimir. And over the years, we've of course learned many Maimorim that explain this Pasuk in many different things and in many different ways. Just like we talk about sun's light. Which radiates to the earth and all those live upon the earth. So the light of the sun makes no change. It makes no difference to the sun, whether it's cloudy or it's a clear day, whether the light of the sun reaches the earth or doesn't reach the earth, and so forth and so on. Why? Because according to Taylor, the light of the sun is only Ha'orah. The light of the sun changes nothing whatsoever in its source, in the sun. By drawing out the light from the sun to radiate to the earth, because it's only a secondary light. And therefore, just like in the marshal, the sun is not affected by what happens to its light. Similarly, Ein Seif is not affected by what happens to its Ha'ara, which we call Malchus, which is Maslabesh Be'elimus. V'nikir agamkein ha'ara zush me'agodl. Even this light, which comes into the world, is also called the great name of Hashem because it's Ein Seif, Al Derech Moshel Shmei Shel like the name of a person that Ein Negeilim Husev Atzmusi Chulu, which doesn't touch the person himself. So you have three things, right? You have the Eibushter, you have Shmei Agodl, the, the the great name of Hakadosh Baruch Hu, and when it comes to Shmei Agodl, we say Leishanisi, 
because the investment of the Abisht in the world is a ha'ara, is a secondary light of that Shmei So the, the Rebbe says in the Maimir, not only is the Abisht not involved in the world directly, ain't safe. Shmei HaGadl is not involved in the world directly. What's involved in the world directly? A ha'ara of Shmei HaGadl, which is called Mal. Ach on the other hand. Ha'ara Zua, reading now, reading now line 20. This secondary or tertiary light, which is called Malchus, which is also a ha'ara, the ha'ara of Ein Seif, which is invested in the world, continues to be Bechines Ein Seif, infinite, Uposhet Betachas Apshitas in plain. And since the light, the secondary light, light of Malchus, is also Ein Seif, and Poshet Betachas Apshitas, the relationship between this secondary light and the world, which are limited and complex and concealed and involve in exactitude and klipa and so forth, is also complicated. But the Kedei, in order, that from the ain't safe light, there should be the possibility of creating Bechines Elimus, a concept of worlds, with a limit and a measure. Vagam Bechines is Chalkosam with a division of different worlds as well. So this ha'ara, the ha'ara, it's adeh hislapshus bechinas kamari adam has to come down into the likeness of adam, which goes on atzilus. So havaya is ein seif, which is higher than atzilus, and ha'ara of havaya comes down into atzilus, and this is why the ein seif, which by itself is pashut, to use the expression which is often used, shtal tzechois arranges itself in the tzir of adam, of sfiris. And because Ein Seif comes down in the Tzir of Adam, of Sfiris, there's a relationship between what's called in the Tanya, Adam HaElyin and Adam HaTachtan, the supernal man, which is Atzilus, and the, and the uh, corporal man, man which is Asir. The Hainu Bechines, Hislapshus Eireis Bekelem, the manifesting of light in vessels. So this is how we get to Adam. Right, it says in the Pasuk, that there is Kise, which is Bria. It says in the past like, that there is Adam, or Mara Adam, or Dmusk Mari Adam, which is Atzilut. What is Adam? Adam is Ha'ara of Havaya. Havaya is also Oyer, and Havaya is Leishanisi. A Ha'ara, secondary light of Havaya, comes on into Atzilus and takes on the Tzir of Adam, and this is Bislapjus in the lower worlds, and this is where you could say Shanisi, and even this is much more complicated. But there's one more thing. This Adam is called what in the Pasuk? This Adam, right? The, the, the Maimir is leading us very, very quickly to understand that these Psukim are talking about Bria and Atzilas, correct? The Musk Hakise is Bria, and in the Pasuk it's Kemaisa Livnas Asaperuch Etzem Bashamayim Loteir. And the Mus Kemara Adam is Atzilus, which is the words Tachas Raglov, and in the next Pasek Leisholach is Yadeh. So in, our, in these two Psukim, you're going to have represented Atzilus and Bria, as you'll see, Ba'arichos, in the Shiurim that are going to be coming up on this Maimed. Correct? But Atzilus, that our Psukim speak of as having a Regal and a Yad, what is Atzilus called? It's called the Lekei Yisrael. Right? The God of Israel, Tachis Rebbe, line 24, Ubechinas Kemara Adam, what is Atzilus? What is the idea that in safe that Me'oid arranges itself in a tzir of Adam? And the Esesfiris is Neshamas. In other words, what is Atzilus? What is the world of Atzilus? Elikei Yisrael, the godliness of the complex order of Yiddish and Neshamas. When you learn about Atzilus, you have different Maimodim. For example, you have some Maimodim that will tell you, Zeis HaTeda Adam, that Atzilus is Teda. There are other interpretations. This Maime says that what is Atzilus? Nisham is Yisrael. Kameshikosov, Adam, Atem. Yidin are called Adam. And Atzilus is the basis for the Tzir of Adam of Nisham is Yisrael. Ki Yisrael, all of Machshav, the Jewish people exist in the Machshav, which means the Machshav of Elam Atzilus. So we have what? The beginning of the interpretations of Apostle. And we're actually going to stop here. And with Hashem, next time I'm going to start again from what I'm calling Kemar Adam. These Kesres, these Kepalach, these titles I put in myself, line 20. And again, what you need to understand is I gave you a huge introduction explaining anthropomorphic illusions as they exist in theologies before Kabbalah and Hasidus. 
And now we're learning our Maimer, which is explaining these psukim anthropomorphically using Kabbalah and Chesidus. And the Alter Rebbe immediately identifies in these psukim an Atzilus and a Bria, and the, 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 the drama or the dynamism of this Pasuk is going to be the interface between the godliness of Atzilus and the godliness of Bria, and different kinds of neshamas, some neshamas and neshamas of Atzilus, and some neshamas and neshamas of the lower worlds, who kafishe is by the commas we're going to be discussing Mitzvah Shem in the next classes.